Here's, here's the big issue. This is the major issue I tried to focus on in my, uh, in my debate with James White, is that who is this interlocutor and what is he objecting to? Because the Calvinist assumes that the interlocutor is somebody objecting against reprobation, Calvinism. Um, God unilaterally picking some people to, to be effectually saved and, and damning all others, um, that this is the objector and, and Paul is answering that objection. And that's not what Paul is answering. As we said before, the interlocutor is first introduced in Romans 3, and it's talking about a, an Israelite who has become unrighteous through his own self, self-righteousness self and his rebellion against the things of God. And now God is blinding him in his rebellion so as to bring about his good purpose through the, his rebellious actions. And then that person finding this out and saying, well, then why are you to blame me? If my unrighteousness brings about your righteousness and your glory and your power, then why am I to be blamed for what you use me to be in my rebellion? That's the interlocutor. And if you understand that, again, Calvinism just just vaporizes. It's just gone. There's no purpose in it because there's no there's no apologetic for it. Romans 9 is their apologetic. It's, it's the basis of all answers to all questions having to do with Calvinism. You saw how quickly he moved from Second Timothy, excuse me, from First Timothy two four and Second Peter three nine, he moved to Romans nine as quickly as humanly possible. Why? Because he knows this is the exegetical ground he has to land in, and he has to get you to understand it from his vantage point with his lenses on, in order to have a, a, a any kind of a, a way to to support his his deterministic findings. He goes on to write: Paul's question makes absolutely no sense if he believed in the free will argument of salvation. Yes, it does if you understand the context. It's not about free will versus determinism. This, this, the, the debate, the, the issue is not about free will versus determinism in, in Paul's mind. And therefore, you don't have this debate in Romans 9. You have the issue of God hardening his elect nation, the Jews, to bring about his promise and his plan through their rebellion. That's the context. And if you understand that, it does make perfect sense as to why he would be answering this interlocutor in that way. What is unjust about providing a way of salvation for all and letting everyone choose whether they will accept it or not? Answer, nothing. Again, that's not what Paul's addressing. He's not talking about whether he's providing salvation for all and letting everyone choose whether they accept it or not. He's talking about those who are pursuing through works or not attaining it, i.e. Israel. Those who are pursuing through faith are attaining it, i.e. the Gentiles. And that it is perfectly just the sovereign right of God to establish his covenant relationship with whom he wants to. And if he wants to establish it through faith and rather than works, then he's perfectly within his right to do so, and that God's promise is being fulfilled through a remnant of believers that are no names, and that his promise and purposes will be fulfilled, but even those hardened have not stumbled beyond recovery, chapter 11. They may be grafted back in if they leave their unbelief after being provoked to envy. Really, really very, very simple when you understand the full context of it. Instead, Paul's conclusion regarding how a person is saved is summed up this way. So then, it does not depend. Again, the word it is not about individual salvation. The word it is about God's uh, election of Israel. And if you, choose, if, you, if you choose to believe that God's election of Israel is about individual Israelites being effectually chosen for salvation, then you might think that this supports Calvinism, but that's not what it refers to. It refers to God's purpose in choosing the nation of Israel to bring about his purpose and his plan through Christ, uh, through redemption. So it does not depend on the man who wills, And so notice, it doesn't depend on the man who wills, and so he brings that into the free will philosophical argument of our day, of Calvinism's day, okay? But man who wills or the man who runs, this is is the same thing. The, The willing and running is the striving of the law, okay, in the mind of Paul. So those who are striving after the law, read Romans 9.30, the Jews are striving, they're willing, they're running after the law. And they're not attaining righteousness, even though they're willing and running after it. It takes a lot of willpower and a lot of striving and a lot of running to fulfill the demands of the Jewish customs and their laws of the Old Testament. That's what he's addressing here. But what he does is he plucks it out of that context and applies it to the free will philosophical argument of 1500s in the Reformation time. And that's not the point Paul's making. And when you understand that, then again, these passages just crumble uh, underneath them. Um, but it, it, but it depends upon the God who has mercy. Now, even if we're talking about individual salvation here, don't don't we all agree that it depends upon God and His choice to save? Yeah, but who does He choose to save? People unilaterally pick before they're born, or people who believe in Him, regardless of what nation they're from. That that's the question. 
And, and, and if you in, misinterpret the text to be about individual salvation, then I can understand how Calvin has come to this conclusion. I used to believe that way too. But when you understand the context, all these things just fall apart. 